Sharon um, to our county today. Um, she, as everybody knows, she's the most successful female um, squash player produced by Great Britain. Um, she's been ranked world number one in 2016. She's been twice world champion. She's won two British Open titles. I think the list goes on. Um, so, um, and a warm welcome. There's a few few other people on the call. So we, we should have a few um, Southeast regional um, squash players. So if you are not from Middlesex, but you're, you're one of our leading kind of Southeast regional players, welcome to you as well. So welcome to Middlesex. Um, and on that note, Paul, I'm going to hand over to you. Oh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you for that. Um, welcome, everybody. Love it to see so many faces um, in these really strange times. You know, I think we all thought we would be way over this and be playing the British o British Junior Open would have just finished and, and what have you, but we're not. We're, we are where we are. Um, it, it is, it's a real privilege and an honour to, to have um, Laura on our call today. Um, you know, what, what Laura... Has achieved in the sport has been has been second to none. The most successful British squash player, female squash player ever. Um, and I and I and I feel very honoured to have actually worked with Laura from a, from a very young age. Not not on, as a personal coach, but at squads, junior squads and and senior squads, world team championships, European ch championships, Commonwealth Games. It goes on and on and on. Our last our last trip together was um, was in. Uh, Dalian, wasn't it, Laura, in, uh, in in China? Yeah, yeah, couple definitely. A couple, couple, couple of years ago. So I feel really honoured to, to have worked with Laura and, and have that, that relationship. Obviously, Danny's been down with us. Uh, Danny Massaro, Laura's husband, has been down to Middlesex and done a couple of couple of three workshops with us. And, you know, the intentions are that we will get Laura and, and Danny down again uh, once, we're back, once we're back up and running. But thank you ever so much for joining us today, Laura. Um, you know... It's great, great you to give up your time and, and, and hopefully, you know, the guys can really get some motivation from you. I mean, this is this is tough times for, for everybody. It's tough times for coaches. You know, I, I keep going, oh, another Zoom call, right? Game face on. Let's get in there. Come on, more press ups, more this, more that. And, you know, and it's hard. It, it, it requires energy and it requires energy from the coach. It requires energy from, from the players to, to, to get stuck into that. So, for all you guys that are doing these Zoom sessions, um, keep it going. You know, we, we will, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I took my mother over to Bournemouth at the week. and She's had her first jab. So these, these jabs are rolling out. So we will be there. And people like Brendan and myself are quite old. We'll be getting the jabs. Uh, we'll be getting the jabs sooner than you lot. Um, so anyway, without any further ado, uh, a lot of you have seen the video that we're going to show today. Um, it's 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 the one that Laura done uh, comment, commented over at uh, the British British Open. Um, I think there's so many lessons that we can get from this. Um, Laura, can you, did you would you like to say what we sort of had a little chat about and, and the sort of messages that you would like to get out from 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 the next sort of 40, 40 odd minutes that we're together? Yeah. Um, so. I, we just thought it'd be really interesting to share the video together. Obviously, I'm talking over the video against Norel Tyab at the British Open. Um, we'll probably just go through the video and pause it through regular points that I'm making, particularly, you know, trying to look at that video. We're talking at the very highest level of women's squash within that video. Um, so it's trying to give you an, a little bit of an insight into kind of my mindset, what I'm thinking um, at that level, but also trying to give you a little bit of an insight into how that can tie in with you, how you can maybe start yourself off looking at the game in a slightly different way and um, try and apply it to junior squash a little bit. Um, so Karts and I talked a lot about you know, you guys being able to come up with with different game plans, maybe how I stick to a game plan, maybe how I stay mentally tough through different game plans um, and different opponents as well. Um, so we can touch upon all of that. And I think if if Karts is happy too, we you know really want it to be kind of interactive. You know, if you guys want to ask questions, now's your time. Um, you know, don't be shy. Um, I know I was always looked quite nasty when I'm on court, but that's probably fair to say that actually that was my game face. I'm at work. I'm not like that really. Carts will, Carts will tell you that when I'm off court, I'm completely different. So um, don't be shy and, you know, speak up. Um, and we hope, hopefully you'll get more out of it that way. 
Can I just ask anyone, do you know what Laura's name was on the tour? <laughs> Come on, Evie, you know it. I, I do know it. I'm just waiting for one of the juniors to pipe in. Come on. Who know? Come on. Some of you are at the workshop. Danny, Danny mentioned it. No? Can't remember? Go on, Evie. Put them out of the misery. Ice queen. The ice queen. <laughs> So, One of you know, the questions I, think, I, think, I was going to ask you, Laura, what do you think about your nickname? I was just afraid that Carts was going to tell everyone his nickname for me, which is... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we keep that one, we keep that one uh, private, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I mean, it probably ties in quite well. I mean, obviously, um, get the chat going and stuff, but a lot of these things that kind of happened throughout my career, um, they... they a, a lot of your personality persona, even perhaps over light, overlapping into belief within yourself comes from the people and the expectations that other people put on you that, that plant that small seed and then start to kind of, it grows in your own mind. So I, I never, you know, thought that I was mentally strong. I never thought of myself as an ice queen. I never thought of myself as really tough and resilient and, Jade, our England physio, always used to call me Laura Findaway because it was like she'd be sat, you know, whether it be at a world teams or a big, a big event when we'd have our physio there. And it would be like the amount of times I found a way to win when I perhaps didn't deserve to. And it's sort of all those little things that people drop into you, whether it's an interview afterwards or, you, you know, oh, you didn't really have a right to win that or you're watching a match back and Vanessa on commentary might say, I don't understand how it's still six all here. She hasn't looked like she's done a lot. And you start to really slowly believe it about yourself even. So it's almost like people can actually help you. And when we will go on to talk a little bit about, you know, playing to your own brand and playing to your own strengths. But when people start to put that on you, you start to believe it in yourself. And then you almost play that way and you believe it. And you're on there thinking, no, I've done it before. I can do it again. Um, and so it's really important. So actually, of course, when the ice queen was, mentioned um I, I liked it because if that's what people think of me and see of me then then I'm happy to portray that and that's probably what I was trying to say before I'm actually not an ice queen but I can be when I'm on court it's fair to say that I actually wanted my nickname to be Medusa <laughs> <laughs> um and if anyone who knows the Greek goddess Medusa has basically had snakes and was the ugliest thing you've ever seen and looks at you and she would turn you to stone and that's, that's what I thought suited me a bit better. <laughs> they said it was too harsh. <laughs> I, was, I was on a call on, on Wednesday with uh, Evie, and, and Evie said that I think we should start to think about this with our Middlesex players coming up for names for them. So I think uh, that's, a, that's a task that we're going yeah. to bring, bring, bring forward. Yeah. And then if, if anyone doesn't like that, if you're pulling faces, it's uh, Evie down there that suggested it. So... Um, <laughs> Okay, okay, so I'll put it on screen now. <clears throat> yeah. Come back on court for the third game of the um, match against Norel Tayeb in the British Open, 2-0 um, up with um, the first game being quite ahead and then just sneaking it 11-9 and the second game being quite far behind, I think 7-2 and winning it 11-9 as well. So feeling quite good I think mentally at the start of this third game um had a good chat with Danny um obviously kind of kind of in a way annoyed at how the first two games went being so far up and only just winning it and then so far down and only just winning it um totally different and you know he just basically said to me you know stick to the game plan we had a game plan to try and frustrate Noah in this match keep it keep the angles down keep the ball tight on the wall and get in front and volley and it was it really really was as simple as that and I played well on this day and uh, I don't think Noah was at her best but sometimes it's always hard to tell whether someone's not at their best because of the tactical plan that you're employing and um yeah, so um, as we start this this third game now, um, I'm obviously just um, leveled back at two all here, and 
And as you'll see that um, as it goes on, I'm, I'm really trying to kind of nullify um, her almost with a mindset of, of popping the ball around the court a little bit. Um, just putting the ball in really good areas and um, putting the ball into corners, using lots of height, trying to keep her, her from getting a grip of kind of any sort of momentum and any sort of shot play. Um, and you can see there, I'm using quite a lot of height where I can, the balls um, going up towards the alarm sign wherever it, wherever I'm in any sort of trouble. And you can see that when I didn't do it, how dangerous she is. Um, so yeah, three all, I guess. Um, my mindset is really just thinking, kind of stay on the volley. And if I can't volley... Sorry, did you say something, Laura? Yeah, I, ju I just said, should we just pause it there and just talk okay. um, about that? So when um, when I'm talking there a lot about that game plan that's been, been set in place, obviously, before I've gone on and um, Danny and I had a really good game plan and, you know, a little bit of an extra insight into this match was... Um, I'd played Tayeb at the US Open and she'd made a bit of a fool of me, if I'm honest. Um, as we all know, like her, her, one of her nicknames that was flying around for a while was the peacock because she starts peacocking around the court. And this is the sort of thing as a player that you're, you know, aware of and, and trying to stop almost. And again, how much of that nickname is tied into kind of what other people put on her and, and, the, and the, the, the persona that she gives off to everybody else. So there was there was certainly an inner determination in this match to not not let her do that, you know. And it, she can start to and by peacock, I think I mean chest goes, shoulders go back, chest comes out, chin goes up, and she starts strutting around the court a lot. And once she's in that once she's in that state, it's really she's confident. It's really really hard to break that. So the I obviously I mentioned it there in the match, and the idea was to frustrate her which I think when Karts and I were talking about linking this into the junior play, it's like, how do you play someone who's a shot player, who's flamboyant and who wants to go for winners all the time? And of course you have to be able to have the skill to contain and frustrate someone like that. But playing straight is a very, very good way to, to frustrate someone using height. There's not many people who are really, really good up high. The best you can really do is defend from up there. So you're looking to use height when you're in trouble rather than trying to do something silly like put a drop shot in when you're at full stretch. Um, you're looking at playing the ball straight so that the ball is on the side wall. And, and what you're looking for is trying to get these, these players who are flamboyant and who want to play shots and who want to get a bit of a like cross-court Nick strut. Um, you want them trying to go for that from really difficult positions. And of course, with a player of Tayeb's quality, you're always going to be on the end of those odd shots that come off really well. But I think for you guys thinking about, you know, maybe if you are going to tournaments and you're playing someone who is particularly skillful um, in a flamboyant way, then playing straight is a, is a really good way to do that. I think, um, Linking into that is probably something what Karts and I spoke about the other day was how, how do you then do that without either feeling like you're being really boring um, and how do, how do you basically stick stick to your plan, right, Karts, when we were just thinking about it from a junior perspective? Um, and I think it comes back really simply to do you want to win or do you want to look good? And for, for me in this match... I've or the lucky thing is, and you guys haven't seen this, you've only seen this match, which went really well. I got made a fool of at the US Open where she's cross-court nicking me and making me look like I don't know where the ball's going because I didn't know where the ball was going. So I've got extra internal motivation to not let that happen again. But it was also kind of, you know, at the end of the day, this is my strength. And I think the biggest thing for you guys to start to understand about yourself is what are your strengths? And the sooner you realize it, the sooner you'll have more success because you'll play to your strengths then. So it's 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 having a, having a serious think with your coaches and it might even be something that you guys can do on another call is like, let's come up with, with, our, with your style of play, which is so different for everybody else. Like trying to uh, get Noor Shabini to play like me is not going to work and trying to get me to play like Noor Shabini is not going to work and um, you have to play to your own strengths and you have to believe in your own strengths 
And you also have to be completely honest and accepting of what your own strengths and weaknesses are. So you might not want to play particularly straight. You might want to play like Shabini, but unless you're prepared to go on and put the work in and put the skill in to get those skills, you have to very quickly accept that the best way for you to play might be slightly different. Um, and that, yeah, I just thought it was really interesting to think about, you know, do you want to win or do you want to look good? And I think that's a lot of an internal, I, I had that as an internal battle when I was like early mid twenties, where I didn't want to be what I perceived as boring. Um, and the more, the more I sort of started to win being what I thought was a little bit more boring, I started to enjoy the turning of the screw and the enjoyment of seeing accuracy in a straight dying length and a simple volley drop rather than you know, my two wall boast, which, which came out, but it comes out as the surprise rather than the overplay. Well, <clears throat> take the ball as early as I can, as you can see there, just cutting the ball off and volleying using good height and um, putting the ball back into good areas. But that was a good volley. It's about using all of my technical kind of um, ability to just pop the ball down the wall with with good shape on the ball if that makes sense so it's not kind of just drilled like an arrow down the wall but faded into the wall and just as she wants to kind of hit it it's hitting the side wall at the back and making her go for something a bit wild there on that cross court nick that she missed yeah shabini hit a shot coach yeah. very I just, uncharacteristic I I just just shot. Okay, sorry. Cross court. it's in but just for just pause it there a bit for us. Back at back so, and Laura, back you, corner. You, just you, you, you talk there, Laura, You talk there about shape of the ball and shaping the line and using the strings and the side wall. Could you just perhaps enlighten us what you mean by that? I mean, I've I've chatted to the high performance guys about it, and, and there's a few people on the call that haven't heard this before. What do you actually mean by fading the ball? What 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 are you trying to do by? Yeah, technically to do that in, yeah links in really well with what I sort of just mentioned in a way of like how can you have fun with a straight ball um you know a lot of a lot of coaches will coach or a lot of players will even think a straight ball is a straight ball you're trying to get it as tight to the wall as you can one floorboard and that of course you know definitely has its place but for me there was um you know, six, seven ways to hit a straight drive down the wall. And that and that goes to how high on the front wall you're hitting it, maybe even more, maybe like 10, 10 ways to hit a straight drive. It goes with height on the front wall. It goes with, you know, how far away from the side wall you hit the front wall. So when you're talking about a fade into the back, it's a specific type of shot that is, you know, you'll all have heard coaches say you're going for floor wall on a drop shot. And it's sort of that, it's sort of getting that same mindset of having a floor wall drive. So there's a, we'll see it a little bit towards the end. I think maybe the last rally or so of this, of this, I put in a bow, she skids in, puts up a cross court lob and it's quite high. And I just, I place it down the wall and she's up and she's about to set off and she can see, you know, her body knows and her mind knows she's not thinking it. She just knows the ball's going away from her. And that's what fading of the ball is. It fades into the back with shape. And so when, when someone says play a straight drive, there's, there are different ways to lose yourself within the, within the skill of a straight drive, the fading one, the, it, are you going for the sort of Nick, Nick in the back where it goes side wall, Nick, back wall, Nick, are you going for the fade into the side mm -hmm. wall where just as they want to hit it, it's hitting the side wall. Um, are you going for the the ultra sort of like Jonah Barrington type down the wall? It's like an arrow, one plank, stick to the side wall because because they're already in that back corner, um, and that that's just you know three different ways, and you can have a, a real lot of fun with that. And that's where when someone says play a straight drive or play straight or hit that target at the back corner, there's three or four ways to hit that back corner because if a ball sits up at the back you've hit your target, but you've given them an angle to hit down on. If that ball goes in and it dies away from them, that's a that's hit the same area of the court, but it's two it's it's putting them in a whole world of trouble that is different to one that sits up. So um I think that was probably what something that I did really, really well in this match. And you can, you know, as I just said, that cross court nick she went, I mean Tayeb doesn't hit cross court nicks at the cut line and give away a stroke like that. 
but the balls are just annoyingly kind of fading away from her a lot. And I think the best in the world is Shabini at that, where the ball constantly, slowly gets just that little bit further away from you all the time. And it doesn't look like much on TV. And before you know it, it's just too far and you can't get it. And it's so frustrating to play a player like that. But when when we talk about it in our uh, Wednesday night sessions, Law, we, we we say we're trying to make the court longer. We're trying to extend the length of the court so the ball's always going away. Yeah, extending it to the front and extending it to the back of the court. Yeah, like, and we've all played, haven't we, on boiling hot courts where that's so difficult to do. You know, you've got a boiling hot court and it feels like there's two of you playing in a space like kind of around like a, a, the tea area. And that's where complete and utter. And one of the best matches I ever watched um, was Nick Matthew playing Daryl Selby on a boiling hot court at Chapel Allerton in Leeds on a hard back plaster court. And it was about, I don't even know, 2010, maybe 2011. So I was not anywhere near my best. And I was unbe- I, I was unbelievably kind of well, I was just in awe of Nick's ability to make a boiling hot plaster court seem absolutely gigantic for Daryl. And it wasn't, it wasn't quick. It wasn't like 20 minutes. It was, it was probably a long, hard 45 minutes. The ball was always going away from Daryl. And I, it was probably the time where I sort of realized how good Nick was technically, how his technical ability was, was able to show up in, in, the hardest of situations for a bloke at that level where they can get anything back. And he, he took, you know, Daryl apart three nil. And I know it's only a league match and I know it's all this, but it really brought it home to me, the the technical ability of being able to find space. And when you guys are at junior tournaments, you're, you're on these courts a lot, aren't you? Hot, bouncy, you know, scurrying around opponents, trying to find space. And, the calmness of technique and the calmness of mind is what gives you the ability to hit space and hit targets a lot of the times. So the calmer you are mentally leads to calmness in the body and calmness in the swing. And probably a lot of my mental strength came from that, being able to be calm at key moments that allowed me to make correct decisions um, in my play. And I don't think enough enough credit is sort of given to people who stay cool under like the, war, the 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 most amount of pressure and I think that's what the top players do really well. Really looking to kind of take the ball early it, it really doesn't look like much when you just watch him but there's two balls there that either could have been let to come off the back wall or um, you know, let bounce, and it obviously again was another shot that just ran into the side wall, and she's kind of probably panicking a little bit at this point. Two nil, five three down from from Tayeb's point of view, and not really looking like she knows too much what's going on. And I would have been told off for that cross court drop off Danny because you know the game plan is to not let her throw that leg and kind of windmill it off, and it just shows when you do open up the court how how she can just get the ball back like she did. And then it was the straight drop that won the rally. And that's what's so important um, to remember. I kept having to remind myself all the time, play straight, use the front two corners, don't play my flick, which I love to play so much. But Noor's so good at just reading those flicks and throwing the leg and the racket out. Pretty sure that was down, wasn't it? (laughs) Another couple of really good straight balls there just make I think it just has that kind of ability to make it makes the court massive for your opponent when you play straight and particularly when you're doing it with the volley combo as well and so from this point now I've gone from three all to seven three and I haven't really done a lot I've just stayed solid and I've let her make the silly decision and then maybe just picked her off at the right time and sort of where the pressure comes from being 2-0 up and, and you know, maybe she knows that, you know, from these positions I'm quite good. Um, don't let people off the hook. And she's gone from being kind of borderline joking and laughing around in the first two games to kind of, kind of now getting quite angry at herself. And I, and I feel on, on that quite well. It makes me very aware when someone... Um. 
So like when you talk there about, uh, or when, when I'm talking there about recognizing that, I think that's something that, um, you know, particularly as a junior, I wasn't massively aware of that. I think coaches used to say to me a lot is sort of like, get your own blinkers off. You know, this is, this is not sort of like a sprint or a swim or a bike where, or a run where it's get from point A to point B and you can just put your blinkers on and go. This is, awareness of what is going on around you and what is going on around you on the court and obviously it helps if you've got a coach helping you with that you know how many times will you come off and go coach will say she's tired or she's injured or she's not moving well to that corner but it's, but sometimes you you've got to be aware of that mid-match mid-game because this is 8-3 and I've just sort of said there I've, I've noticed a change in her in her body language which has gone from two nil down I, I still reckon I could sort of dig myself out of this hole to two nil and eight three and now I'm angry because I'm 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 looking like I'm not going to dig myself out of the hole and I'm looking like I'm going to get an absolute pummel in on quite a big stage and I've noticed that because I know that with with Noor particularly her response to anger is probably you know it can go either way she can actually pick her level up here because of that and I think if you're not aware of that change, if you're not aware of seeing an opponent get angry or get down or the body language changing, whatever that change is, rallies can go like that. And in junior squash, in senior squash even, they can go it really, really quickly. And before you know it, if she if she gets angry here and she puts off like, you know, I, I relax and three or four rallies go, before we know it, we're back at eight, six. And then that's a totally different, it's only three points, but it's a totally different ball game when it comes to playing someone of Norse quality. So it's awareness for one, and it's what are you going to do now? You have that knowledge, now you have that awareness. And that is kind of like back to the game plan, back to the process, back to, and I, and I wanted to sort of say to you guys, quite often I would just be bouncing the ball to serve. And I'll, all I will be saying to myself is, can I volley? Simple as that, can I volley? And that sets me up because, you know, it makes me go forward off my serve rather than back. Can I volley the first ball that she hits? Can I make that court long because I'm volleying? And then am I, if I volley, she can't volley. So I'm putting her in awkward positions again. So it's, it's, I just wanted to sort of stop there and go, that's a really big thing for you guys to be aware. And you, there is no chance here. And I think I say it in a minute that I am like resting, resting on sort of my laurels and thinking for a moment, this match is done at two nil and eight, three, if anything, I'm sort of more edgy about what could happen in, you know, if I don't carry on with my foot down. I think, I think you actually say later on, you say you actually, you, you, your concentration and focus is, is, is even greater at the closing part of the game. Yeah, definitely. And and that comes because of the stupid mistakes I've made when I'm younger from 2-0 and 8-3 and lost. And all the times I haven't been mentally strong and the times that I remember that no one else remembers that I've lost, the times I've lost 12-10 in the fifth because I refused a drop shot and I played it long again because that's always my default. You know, someone else would be to overplay the drop shot. Mine was just to not attack, not be positive. To There's a difference between playing playing well and playing playing good quality length and there's a difference to being refusing the positive opportunity which re refusing the volley refusing the short ball that is on that has been earned and created and yeah I think ab absolutely it's um playing around with the score there's probably I, I don't remember but there's a fair chance here that I'm probably pretending I'm three eight down um because I flipped I flip scores in 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 most matches, to be honest, whoever they were, because it was the way that I found to keep my foot down and to keep myself concentrated when I was actually in the lead. Um, so I would be thinking I'm eight, three down, try and push on. Or if I'm sort of six, six, four up or seven, four up, I'm sort of thinking I'm, we're, we're at seven all. So I played around with the scores as a, as a bit of a mental trick for myself to keep me concentrating and to keep me pressing down on, on what I wanted to do. As emotional state changes on a match, I'm, I'm very, very aware of when someone is, is behaving how they normally do and maybe behaving out of character and knowing that I've potentially got them um, in a place they don't want to be really. 
I mean, that was a let ball there, but I was quite happy with that that rally. Couple of really good injections of pace, tight balls. You know, she doesn't really want to be playing them balls, so just happy to kind of replay the rally again. It just shows like her, you know, how good she is around the middle when you just leave it at the front. She's very astute with uh, when to use the reviews as well, Masaro. Yeah, missed the trick there. Really good straight ball there, just throwing the leg again looks quite simple, but most people kind of probably would panic there and maybe open up the court. I'm trying to keep it straight, as you can see. Straight, straight and high if I'm under pressure, straight with pace if I'm not. Just nullifying her here and almost making her feel like she has to do something spectacular to get into the rally and and she's going with me which is which is what you'd expect from someone of this quality playing straight well and you know it's a tough rally this she's she's got a lot of balls back and um i think i've done quite a good job of staying straight there hunting that ball down and not thinking about coming to the back of the court and then the straight volley is the shot that wins it there again. I think at that point, at this point, I I think that was the rally I was talking about earlier where it was a long, hard rally. And I think it's also important to say that if I'd have lost that rally, obviously would have been back at 8-6 where I'd have just said I've lost three rallies in a row because of a change of state that I was actually aware of at the time. And, you know, credit to her, couldn't actually do much about. But it was that, how solid was that rally at at, five, at four, uh, five, eight to to go so solid like that to be so relentless with the game plan, and then that was the the ball I was talking about where she's ended up. My boast has actually opened up the court, but because I've not played it so much, she's had to slide into it. She's fallen over, and then that drive that Carts just mentioned that was, you know, it was that volley was above the cut line but it was behind the service box and it sort of faded into the sidewall and then nicked out. So even if she stood up and you saw her go, I can get, oh no, I can't. And if that ball is sitting up off the back wall or you haven't caught the sidewall and it's sort of, you know, not nicked in to die down or it's a bit lower and it's gone into the service box, there's another tie up dive coming there. We've all seen her do two, three dives in a row because she's, I can get it, I can get it. And that's that calmness, even at 5'8", but after a really hard rally, that's a really basic rally, let's be honest, in terms of tactics, it's calmness under pressure that wins the rally. Um, and it didn't look like much. And she just stands up and goes, yeah, too good. And it's not a cross court, Nick, and it's not all that. And, and that, and that's the difference. And now I'm nine, five instead of six, eight, and it's massive. It, it was such a big rally that, and it's recognizing that at, at the time, I think. I kind of thought without getting too complacent that that might have been the match right there because, you know, it was a tough rally. She was on the end of it and I just kept moving the ball around the court and she'd done a lot of work there. So she's probably going to shoot in this next rally and try and get something crazy. And oh, I did well to pick her off. Another running ball. Camps is laughing. I'm looking out probably a bit like what you're laughing at. I'm not over the line yet and that's the thing I've learned in my career just make sure that you push for that last point as if it's as if it's nine all nine all in the you know in in a, in a game and when you're ahead it's almost even more concentration because the last oh shot because the last thing that you want to do is is lose a lead from this far up so even more focus to the plan even more focus to every shot that you play, meaning on every single ball. And there you go. She was she was actually pretty good at the end of this match and she said uh, there as we're just talking that, um, that I got the better of her today and that my game plan was too good and maybe she realised how much I was restricting her play and her flamboyancy and the way that she likes to play the game. but. Danny and I really set out with this match with uh, a really, really clear but very, very simple game plan. And, you know, that's probably one of my proudest matches in terms 
of actually sticking to the simplicity of the game plan and um, that set me up with a match um, against Noel Shabini. There you go. Yeah, thanks. And I, I think that, um, you know, just just to reiterate again, um, the reason that she she was so grac gracious at the end of that and was able to sort of say, you got me like the game plan was too good. You restricted me too much. It was it was that she got 100 percent respect from me because of the lesson she'd given me at the US Open and me wanting to have the determination to overturn that rather than just wanting that to happen again. And I guess that's the level of respect that that you should be showing opponents that it's like you did me at the US Open, but I'm going to get you back. And then I did her at the I did her at the Brit at the British Open. And she's saying at the end there, and she actually messaged me after the match as well, which is quite common for Tayeb. She's a bit like that, but she'll be like, you you totally did me today, but I'm going to get you back next time, which is not my style at all, but um, probably something more the blokes would do. And I was like, I'm sure you will, because that's battle, right? That's squash and that's respect. And I would expect nothing less than the three or four in the world to go back, absolutely analyze that match and go, you're not going to do that again to me. And um, if nothing else, that's the greatest thing about sport, earning each other's respect in that way. And she earned my respect after the US Open and she got she she got shown how much I respected her by that British Open match. And um she 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 went away and, and respected me even more for that. So it's important to, I think, start to be aware as a junior that sometimes it's not all you, sometimes it's them. And sometimes it can be a really good lesson for you to actually go away and, and sort of kind of learn from that and grow from that and be better from a loss. Um, and then that way it doesn't get you down too much either. Anything to add, Katz? Sorry, just unmute myself. No, I mean, I've seen that. I think I've seen that about five or six times now and I'm learning from it all the time. And it's just so nice to have your your commentary over the top of your commentary. Um, and I think there was, I, I made notes each time I've gone through it and referring to notes, I was with um, Evie the other day on a call and I've done the same thing with Rosie. Uh, Rosie's on the call, Rosie Wink from the British Army that I work with. You know, I think we said that, you know, you, 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 you didn't allow yourself to play your favourite shot. You, you flick, you know, that's your favourite shot. You love getting the ball at the front, holding it and flicking it across the front. Yeah. And you win lots of points and you win lots of matches by by doing that shot. But yeah. you knew against her, you couldn't do that. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's, a real, that's a real discipline of mind, isn't it? Uh, you know, uh, that is my favourite shot. That is my strength. I'm great at that. Yeah. But today, I'm not allowed to do that. Yeah, and you I know, think and, I played and, one. And then, you played and then one. You yeah, and it was the I knew it was the wrong shot, and I probably didn't play it properly because I knew I shouldn't be playing it. And it it was um, I think with I think with Tayeb particularly, it's it's not that I couldn't have got away with playing that shot. It's that that shot normally wins me points, and against Tayeb, she's so good laterally. She throws her leg out, and that's what I mentioned it. And I don't I just wanted to touch upon a technical point that Danny and I had picked up on. She, she, when she's moving laterally, she throws her leg out like almost in a bit of a windmill effect. And it's something that Danny and I picked up on. We're, we're crazy detailed like that. And when you play a straight ball, there's no room to do that. She has to control the end of her lunge because the side wall's in the way. But when the ball is getting played across her body, so she moves laterally to it, she throws the leg out in sort of like a straighter effect. And she can, that's where she dives. You very rarely see a, see a dive on a straight ball because the sidewall's in the way. And a lot of people dive on a cross court, right? Because they're like, they're running from one corner to the other and they're at that angle where they can go forward. And so, although she got a lot of those straight balls back, I won a lot of rallies just on a clinging tight ball because she was on top of it, but she's sort of jammed in. And that's the sort of technical, technical things that we're picking up on. And I think... Um, not playing my favorite shot wasn't necessarily because I didn't think I'd get the odd winner. It was to stop her getting those good feelings mentally of being able to throw that leg and dive because people who do that get a huge mental pickup of I've dived and everyone's like, ah, oh, or I've got a ball back that no one expects me to, or 
that's an unbelievable shot and I feel good because I managed to get it back and it's Laura's best shot. So it was more about taking those feelings away from her rather than rather than not playing the shot because I thought it would get me in trouble. It, it, can you see that there's a, a bit of a difference yeah. there mindset wise? Absolutely. Laura, if I can ask a question, you talk about going away and learning after a loss like you did in the United States. That's a difficult conversation to have with, with juniors. When is the best time to have that chat? Um, that that depends on the person, and I guess that's the toughest thing about being on a being a coach because I I was actually someone who was so angry with myself sort of after the match that um, I could always I, I always wanted to know what I could have done differently right there right then. What did I do wrong in the match that could have won me the match? And I was probably at my most open to receive that information. Um, probably, probably fairly soon after the match. And, you know, Danny, Danny and I would obviously, and if DP was at a tournament, we would quite often go, you know, someone would come up and go, you know, unlucky, you could have done this, you could have done that, get a shower, let's talk about it later. I'd obviously process the match myself in my mind and we'd go out for dinner and it would be then that it it would be, you could have done this, you could have done that. And I'm not going to lie, it's it's hard oh. and, it's, and it's painful to hear <laughs> and it hurts and it stings because someone's telling you, if you'd just done this, you could have won that match. And for me personally, I almost felt like, let me go again. I want to go again. I can change it. I can change it. And mm -hmm. I think it's hanging on to that feeling in your training for the next couple of weeks that really gives you that pick me up of I'm training now in these, in these weeks that are, that are coming up because I don't want that feeling again, because I want to be able to do something that I didn't have. And for me, it was always talking about being proactive, being able to play drop shots, being positive. Um, but um, I guess my point is that some people are not ready for that straight after. Um, some people want a couple of days to let it sting, um, get over that sad, sad feeling and that disappointment and then come back maybe the week after. And I don't know personally if that's a good thing. Um, I don't know if you have to learn to be able to take the feedback fairly, fairly quickly for it to make an impact because um, that's not how I am. Um, but I always feel like, come on, let's get on the phone and let's talk fairly soon after, because the more that you don't, the more that kind of festers and builds up and can sort of become a bit of an issue. I think what we've tried to do, uh, Laura, is, is I, I, I've recommended to the guys, when, if they've lost to somebody at an event, go and try and watch the player that you've lost to in the next round. Yeah. You know, that's painful as well, because I should I should be in that round and I should be in, in the semi-final or whatever it is. But go and watch that player. And you, you, you know, because sometimes, you, you, you know, at a young age, you don't know why you've lost and, and you know, your emotions are. But if you go and watch somebody play, oh, actually, they're really good at, at, at the forehand volley drop. But, and I might they might not have experienced that in the game. They might not have understood that. But just to watch, and you actually then get in this this sense of watching through coaches' eyes, that is, which is yeah. what we're, we're doing today. And I think that, that's a real, that's a hard lesson to do, but, but a really worthwhile uh, uh, job. Look, I mean, I, I've had those chats with a couple of girls who are, you know, young, young pros, 20, 21 years old, where, you know, they've lost at a PSA tournament. And I'm, I'm, I'm as a coach, watching the person they've lost to the next day, mainly because I just like to watch, but also to be like, what, what did they actually do? What are they doing on court? And I'm looking in the crowd, so like I expect that player to be sat there. I don't know, maybe I've, I just expected it and maybe you shouldn't expect that as a coach, but because I always did it and I text and say, like, where are you? You watching? Yeah, yeah, I'm in my room watching on Squash TV. And I'm like, guys, no, you need to get there for two reasons. One, when you're there in person, firstly, it hurts a lot. But you need it because that's the sort of stuff that is going to really make you work hard in training and want to change things up. And the three, actually three points. Secondly, is because you see things in real time that you will miss on squash TV, facial expressions, slight bending over. They're playing a replay and you've missed the facial expression of body language when that player's missed a certain shot. You miss the finer details that are so important when you watch a match live. And thirdly, the, and perhaps the biggest thing 
what does that send to your opponent when they see that you've beat you've they've beaten you the next day and you're sat front row watching you know that that's massive because i've been there and i've come off like if i saw nor sat the next day supporting supporting shabini that says a huge amount of to me about her mental state about you know she's not sulking or she might be sulking but she's got herself down to the club she's dusted herself off She's got a chin up and she's gone, you beat me yesterday, but I'm here and I'm here to learn. And it hurt me, but it didn't hurt me enough that you've put me down on the floor for three days. And, and, that, and that's huge. Um, and, it, and whether or not people say it or not, you notice as a player when someone you've beaten the next day is there watching you and it's worrying. It, it's worrying you're like, damn it, they've, they've got themselves out of bed and they've come down to the court to try and get a sneaky little like, right, what happened there then? Um, and, and I think that's three things to really think about when it comes to kind of watching matches back and after you've lost. Hold on. I'm going to open the floor to the juniors um, to ask questions. So if you've got a question, please, uh, please fire away. Can I, can I, I mean, there are some people that put some questions in advance. Um, and if I could ask those person, people first, and then we'll, we'll ask for more questions if that's all right so um first one was amy amy chapman no not on the call okay um damien you had a question um if you could give what would be your top piece of advice for your 12 or 13 year old self if you could meet them in real life today um so it's a great question and um I've been putting some, I've been putting a little bit of thought into this and, and I guess there's, there's two ways to answer it. It's that, and I jokingly said to Danny about the question, I just say, just carry on. Cause you get to be world champion in 2013. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that's not what you mean. Um, and it's so tough because, um, and I'm trying to put this really simply, we are, we are who we are now. We're all who we are, whatever age we are. And we also are who we are not yet. And I don't know if Danny's ever, ever, ever used that line with you guys, because that, that resonates with me so much. So even though now I'm, I'm, you know, kind of looking back on my career, when it comes to sort of my coaching, I am who I am. I've achieved everything I've achieved, but I am what I am not yet. And that is, you know, I'm, I'm not a coach who's produced any players. I'm not somebody who is, I'm not a mum. I'm not, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of, I'm not, I haven't progressed on in my other roles with England squash. I haven't progressed on with um, the role that I use with head. And so all of there's loads of things I haven't progressed on in some of the courses that I'm running. So I am who I am not yet. And there's a huge amount of um, there's a huge amount of of satisfaction in that if you can if you can learn learn that and and also with where I am now and I'm probably going off on a bit of a tangent but I am who everything that I am now is what I've been already so I think I think for you for you asking that question I know that there's sort of like a little bit of a, a gem of information that you're sort of like what what can you say to me to help me maybe be a little bit better and. That would be very simply all the advice that I've, that I've given already, which is um, you're on this call, which is brilliant. You're open to learning. You want to progress and be the best player you can be. Take all of that on board, but mainly try try to understand yourself and have faith that your your path is going to open up ahead of you. Um, I guess, I guess the thing that I'm most proud of, if I can look at it like that way from the age of 13 upwards, and I touch, I've touched upon it a little bit, is constantly surround yourself with people who will be honest with you and constantly surround you and constantly try to be honest with yourself. And from a place of honesty, um, which, com which with honesty become, comes trust, um, you will start to work to open up sort of new new visions of what of what you can achieve and like I said when you come off a call honestly what happened in training honestly what happened mentally 
am I am I opening up myself to work on my mental side of the game and seeing that as a strength to work on the mental side of the game the way that you would step into a gym and work on the muscular side of your game so you don't you don't step in the gym because you've got a muscular weakness you do it to get stronger and so from a mental perspective I think looking back, I'm, I'm really proud of the open-mindedness to kind of take everything on board from like the mental side to the gym, to the squash, to the technique and, and see it as an ability to improve every area rather than seeing it as if I'm working on that stuff, it's a weakness that I need to get better. Does that make sense? Was it all a bit deep? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Um, next was... Bilal, Bilal's one of our parents. Yeah. Got a question. Put your, put your mic on, please, Bilal. Hi, thanks, Vicky. Um, Laura, thank you for that. That was really interesting. Um, as a parent, uh, um, one of the things that came out from your talk was uh, your constant reference to, you know, having the mental strength to deal with um, in-match issues and post-match and, and through a tournament. Um, how would you recommend for, you know, a lot of our young teenagers um, how to build that mental strength um, over time? I think that's something that the kids struggle with um, because it's not something innate. And it's, you know, whether they become squash pros or not, um, having that mental strength is really helpful, um, you know, in, in other parts of your life, in other parts of, you know, other careers as well. So I think it's really important for them to try and understand how to build that mental strength. Thank you. Yeah, great question. And, and absolutely, it's, it's, you know, whether you end up being a pro athlete or not, you, the more disciplined you can be, and the more kind of in control of your, of your mind, you can be, I guess, the, let's, let's say the more straightforward your life's going to be, there's going to be less peaks and troughs, maybe emotionally, which is, you know, even in this time is really tough. So um, I think, I think it's getting into good habits. I think it's setting yourself up with good habits. Um, for me, things that always worked, and I don't know if, if this linked into mental toughness or not, but I always had say like my week planned in terms of training. Um, if it's written down in front of you, it, it becomes very easy to kind of commit to that and to get it done which gives you a huge amount of sense. Well, I personally felt a huge amount of pride and satisfaction. Um, but in terms of mental strength as, as a pure mental strength sort of work, work ethic and, you know, trying to be a bit more resilient and being a bit tougher, it's, it, it does come back a little bit to that honesty that I just took, spoke about um, are, are you having a little bit of an issue and, you know, do is, is there areas that you can improve? And that starts with, I would say a couple of things, starting off with a few really basic books, um, being honest with yourself and being able to talk to people that you really trust is a massive thing. I'm a big, I'm a big sort of uh, feeling, I, I share my feelings um, a lot. And I hope it helps to sort of say that I used to get extremely nervous before matches um, and it massively, massively helped to go and tell somebody and to speak about it and to deal with those issues. And I think the more that we push them down, my psychologist, um, who was not your traditional sports psychologist either, he was just like a friend who was, you know, a bit like, a bit like Danny, who's just seems to know what to say at the right times, I feel. Um, he told me that, you know, your emotions are a little bit like a football if you're in water. You would imagine trying to hold down like a bit of a football underneath the water and it's got that that tension that's always trying to pop up above the surface and if you keep pushing it down and pushing it down eventually you're going to run out of strength or you're going to have a weak point and it's going to break the water and smack you in the face and so what you're trying to do is deal with these emotions um, and talk about them and open up and be honest and as hard as that is and as vulnerable as you feel at the time you're trying to stop yourself a shed load of pain in the future by it's smacking you in the face when you absolutely don't need it. Um, so for me, there's a couple of things that relate to nerves. If it's helpful, I, I just thought maybe it might really help you guys. Um, so sharing is obviously one thing letting for me personally, talking it out, you know, I might even have gone up to, I remember carts at the last world teams when I actually came to you and camps and said, I think you should drop me for the France match. And you guys that, both yeah. looked at me and went like, 
I don't, I don't know if I've ever told anyone that story. I obviously had a conversation with Danny about it. I approached carts and camps and I'm number one in England and I'm playing Camille and I'm, I'm, I was, I was pretty low on confidence. If you remember in that, that I'd had, you know, I, I was struggling with whether to retire or not, I think. And yeah. I went to carts and camps and said, I think you should drop me for the France match. Um, I don't have a lot of success against Camille and I'm a bit wobbly and I want to give you the opportunity to feel like you can drop me if you want to, because we had SJ who was quite good against Camille and we had Al at two, who probably wasn't going to lose to Colleen. And then we had Lusty at three uh, if I'd have been dropped. And I think even having the strength to go and say that to those guys that day, um, basically, um, when, when they, they, <laughs> you went away, didn't you? And went, let me have a think about it. And then you both came back and said, we don't want to drop you. You're right. You know, it says a lot more to our, to other teams if we drop our number one and we believe in you and we did it. And, and it gave me a huge lift because they, they told me that they believed in me and that they wanted me in the team. And, and it, I didn't do it for that reason. If they'd have come back to me and said, thanks for the, we're going to drop you. It's absolutely the right thing. I'd have been like relieved because I didn't want to play. Um, <laughs> but it gave, it gave me a huge amount of strength. And I actually went, I did lose the match, but I went on and played pretty well, didn't I, against Camille? Yeah, I, did. Yeah. I actually lost in five yeah. and it was, it was tight. And, yeah. Yeah. And she was playing really well that week. And so I'm, I'm trying to get across to you is that these difficult conversations are really important to have. Cause if I hadn't have had that conversation and I'd have stepped on that court against Camille that day and not said what I felt, I'd have probably just lost three nil and probably almost done a self-fulfilling prophecy um so I think talking about it giving your emotions out I think voicing your nerves and things like that and then I guess what I'm getting at in terms of dealing and getting stronger mentally is when you're in a place where that clarity and freedom of mind is there you actually have the mental capacity to concentrate on what you're trying to do you have the mental capacity to stick to a game plan and to dig in and to have all of the mental thoughts that, you, that are actually helpful rather than the ones that are actually really not helpful, which is I never really wanted to be playing this match against Camille anyway and everyone's going to think I'm a load of rubbish because I've not been playing well all week. You do not need to have those thoughts in a heat of a match like that. Um, I don't actually know if I've answered the question there. <laughs> Sorry. No, that was good. That was helpful. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so open it up to the floor. Is, is, if you've got a question, if, just, just in case there's a lot of questions, we'll ask you to raise your hand so we can do them. Um, so is that Antoine? It's Arthur. Arthur, sorry. So uh, how, how do you control your mental state in the middle of a game, like, like stop, stop yourself from getting frustrated if you lose more and more uh, rallies? I think, I think for me, it, it, and I'm always, I, am, I think it's important to say that I'm someone who is thought, thoughtful about what I do and structured. So, you know, for me, going on playing very straight against Tayeb was something to get excited about and something to stick with. Um, I know that not everybody is like that and some people don't want to be so tied down. Um, and so, again, that's understanding yourself and really having that honesty around, like, do, do you want to have a real strict game plan like that and can you concentrate on it? Um, or do you want to go on and play a little bit more freely and not have any thought going through your mind at all? And they're, they're totally different things. But for me personally, it was, you know, I think I said at the beginning of that video, I won the first really, I won the, I went way up in the first and only won it 11-9. And then I went way down in the second and won it 11-9, came all the way back. And it always very simply comes back to trying to be within the process. So the minute you start thinking about if I beat this opponent, it's going to mean this, such and such a body's watching. So that means they're going to be impressed. Oh my God, such and such a body's watching. And that means they're going to be disappointed. Um, the minute you get too far ahead of yourself with who's watching, what the result will mean, how big it will be, how bad it will be, it all just becomes a real blur. So for me, it was always very simply, like I said in the video, actually just 
serving was very simply process can I volley the next ball can I volley can I volley can I volley and then on top of that whatever the game plan would be can I play straight 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 and I, I didn't stop the video at the time but even on that match ball where we had that crazy rally and I cross courted out of the front four and she did that flamboyant sort of fan shot into the corner it's come because if it's come because I've cross courted the ball so it's a great shot, but let's be honest, it should have gone straight down the wall and it's match because she stood hanging for the cross. And that's the honesty of, again, like, do you watch that match and go, oh, one, three, nil, it was perfect. Or do you watch it and go, that should have been done a rally earlier than it was. So it's really getting back to that process. I always used to have notes between games, which was really simple, nothing special. It was mainly to do with myself, um, which would be, top top line pretty much can I volley um, for me it was always stay light stay up in my movement because if I sunk down I got very heavy in my movement and didn't move freely and then something probably technical that was working for me that week and, and they were my go-tos that I always thought of and they were there to remind me between games because that's what I felt was most important um, so yeah it's nothing nothing too special I think just adding on to that to be able to train that in training is really important as well. So you can't expect to go on in a training match or in a, in a routines based session and be all over the place mentally thinking about what you're having for dinner and what your mates up to and whether they're beating you on, you know, whatever, and then go on in a match and expect to just be good mentally. The mental practice comes in training. And so, you know, however you do that, whether it's, a practice match that you refuse to lose and that you put something on it you know quite often we'll put a tenor at the front of the court because it, it just gives you that extra little match feel it'd be you know getting someone to feed you or being on a ball machine and trying to hit 20 targets in a row and if I did it I got myself a little prize it might be something really small like a piece of cake or a coffee and a, you know a, a, a latte instead of americano because that's how strict I was with my diet um a new back in the day I'd buy myself a new album or something like that and um, so it's little rewards but that you only get when you've done something that you're proud of and it's secretly training your mental your mental sort of um, concentration as long as you can thank you anyone else Alice Um, kind of on a similar note, but you talked about like the importance of keeping calm at key moments on court. Is there anything that you do before really important matches just to keep that calm on court and yeah, deal with pressures on court? Yeah, um, so a couple of things, I guess. Um, when, when it comes to keeping calm on court, um, I always, and this is hopefully something that's, that you guys can take and improve on and certainly maybe start to be aware of, of things, but calmness, calmness comes from a couple of things. It comes from um, fitness. And I think it's actually huge to say that a lot of my mental strength and toughness and calmness came because I was able to concentrate on what I needed to concentrate on, on the, at the time. Um, I once had a psychologist working with me um, when I was trying to beat Nicole um, and he came round to the house and we watched a video of me playing Nicole and I, I sort of had started to think I had a bit of a mental block again I mean everybody thought they had a mental block against Nicole but I thought that maybe he could help me get over from a psychological point of view to beat Nicole and we watched the match together and at the end he said you haven't got a psychological problem, you've got a physical problem. And until you can get yourself into the shape that's needed to beat Nicole, you, are, you won't beat her. Because the minute that you get tired, your brain gets pulled to how tired you are. We all know that, right? So I know that's not particularly helpful, but- It really is really helpful. And being really <laughs> strong, it is helpful. <laughs> really helpful um yeah i it, it's it's really important that when you get to one all and six all seven all eight all you're the one that can push on for three rallies and and i think a lot of people put that down to a mental issue and and quite often it isn't i'm working with a lot of players and you get to know their little tells and you go she's tired three rallies gone 
and you're like, damn it, because that's not a mental issue. That's that's a mental issue that's caused by a physical issue because your legs can't do what you want them to do or your mentality can't stay focused on what you want to do. Um, and I think that I think that that's that's really important. Um, the calmness also comes from understanding how you want to play the game. So again, if you're opening up the court a lot, going for cross court nicks and cross courting the ball and putting a lot of boasts in, generally the play is very frantic and very open, and that's very hard to stay calm when it's like that. So you know, trying to play to suit your calmness if that's something that you're aiming for and you play better when you're calmer which I did and I'm not sure that is the same for everyone then you have to understand how to create calmness in play that equals calmness in my calmness in play equals calmness of mind um and lastly again like just just to reiterate get out any of those issues that you've got before the match. So don't let that ball smack you in the face when you're at nine all in a fifth, because you have a negative thought about what's happening. Talk about it. And um, maybe this will help a little bit, but one thing that was massively, massively helpful for me was my, what the guy that I was working with said to me that every negative thought that we have, has a positive intention that it's trying to tell you something. So my, my negative thought always used to be before going on court, what if I lose this match? And he would say to me, what, what's, what's the positive intention of that thought? Like it's trying to tell you something. It's trying to warn you. What's it trying to warn you about? And it's not easy to understand that, but again, it's honesty and it's thinking about it. And I, and I would think it's trying to warn me not to be complacent. It's trying to warn me take this match seriously and, you know, get a game plan, respect your opponent and step on that court like they're the world number one and you're, you, you know, you've got a tough match. And if that opponent could raise it to that level, you were, you were already at that level to deal with it. It's really hard to go on a bit complacent and a bit worried and your opponent play amazing and try and actually change that in the match. So um, I think that it's, it's that. So if, if you're nervous why are you nervous? And then ask yourself what what you what your body or your mind weirdly is trying to actually tell you through that nervous feeling. And it's surprising how you, only you will know. It'll be crazy. It'll be it's trying to protect me from injury. It's trying to tell me, you know, like don't worry about who's watching or whatever. And then you can actually deal with that. You can go and speak to whoever you need to speak to, or you can deal with it um, however you need to. So there was a brilliant tip that helped me loads. Laura, yeah. what are your views on nonverbal communication between player and coach during a match? And should it be encouraged uh, amongst juniors? Um, I mean, uh, yeah, I, if, if it depends why. It, if if it's out of desperation and a, and and willingness to to win, um. No, if it's encouragement and um, and um, you know it comes from a positive place, then then absolutely, I would look out at Danny a lot, and I used to look out at, at carts and camps when I was playing for England, and I had to say to camps at one point, like, when I look at you, you need to do something because you look back at me like, carts is always brilliant at that he'd always give it one of them or a little nod or whatever because that and if you're looking out as a player that's what you want a little bit of encouragement and a little bit of like I'm looking out for a reason I'm wobbling I'm wobbling a little bit here and I need something it might be a little pick me up it might be a smile it might be you know we believe in you if nothing else like I just wanted to sometimes see that everyone was was watching and you know into it the last thing you want as a player is seeing a coach like laughing out the back and not really interested when you're giving it your all so absolutely I think non-verbals are brilliant I mean obviously there becomes a line doesn't there when the Egyptians are all kind of like trying to coach and you know really getting involved and and DP DP was useless at it you know he's not someone if I if I was there at a tournament with DP on my own I never looked out because he just he's just going to look back at you and it doesn't matter how many times he tell you you ask him not to to do something he's not going to do it because it's not his style Danny was the complete opposite he would always 
give me something and it helped all the time. So yeah, I, I think if it's a, if it's for positive reasons and it's what the player wants and I think Danny's probably spoke to a lot of you guys about this as well, but kind of having those conversations before you step on court is a big deal. So as soon as I knew camps wasn't doing what I wanted it to do, it was camps. When I look out at you, you need to do this. And I've had several conversations with coaches over the years about how I want to be spoken to between games as well, because if someone comes over all a bit fluffy and nice and a bit tense, that's not it for me. I need to be told and I need to have, someone with strength around me um and that and that's difficult because I think that the higher up the rankings you get the harder it is for a coach a young coach to come over and really take authority with you um but it's important thank you um so we've we've run over quite a bit um oh, well, that's, no, that's okay that's, that's nice nice to do that but we've got another court 12 30 so I'm very conscious of time that you might want to get a drink in between should we should we have one last question if there is any, if not, we'll uh, sum up. I have a question if nobody else does. Go ahead, Evie. Um, so, Laura, were you, were you a top junior um, in, you know, were you, you know, we have obviously got the juniors that everybody's looking at, but I know that there are certain top players like Nick Matthew wasn't a top junior, but then decided to come pro and work really hard at it. So um, were you a top junior and when did you decide that you, you wanted to go pro? Um, I was, I was a top junior in terms of the England level, um, not, not so much on a world level, I'd say, although the world juniors was every couple of years. So, um, I didn't get to play it at the year that I was, at, was probably at my strongest at 18. Um, I'd say, I'd say I was a good junior, um, you know, at num being number one in your country, number one, two through your country is, is a good junior, isn't it? Um, the difficulty was like when when I set out on tour was trying not to have expectations of like everybody else. So I came through a really strong era that I think really helped me. Um, you know, on a world level, it was same within a year, a year difference of sort of Nicole David, um, Omnia Abdul, Kawi, Jenny, Alison. Um, and then below that, we had the people sort of nipping on our heels as well, like Tina Ricks and um, Sarah Kipax and Susie Pierpoint and you know they were all sort of nipping at your heels a little bit too so you had it coming from both levels you were trying to chase there and you also were trying to keep above them um I started out on tour and decided to go pro um after I'd done my A levels and um made it sort of like top 40 fairly quickly and then and then stagnated a little bit and that was where, where it was really tough because Jenny and Alison particularly really pushed on very quickly they broke top 20 and top 10 a long time before I did and it it was really hard work it, mentally to kind of feel like I wasn't necessary I wasn't failing a little bit because I wasn't keeping up with what they'd done in the game and um it's easy now looking back seeing the success that I had and how and how it all came together in the end but there was a really tough period through that sort of like mid, early mid 20s and you sort of go, oh yeah, it was it was just sort of probably 21 to 26, maybe 27. That's a long time when you're living it and you're not having a lot of success and you going all the way to Malaysia and playing one round and coming back. Um and and it's just sort of trying to all of these things that I talked about today are the finer things of you know, make just making those small steps. And I wanted to finish my career feeling like I'd left no stone unturned and I'd really kind of got everything going as much out of my career as I could. And that was always my goal. And so now looking at it from the other side, feeling like I'd done that, it was constantly working through um, improvement because yes, I was a good junior. It maybe took me a little bit to transition through that senior, through that junior to senior period was probably my hardest part, I think. Okay. There was one more question from Sharon's. Is oh, it yeah. 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 Um, let's say your game plan isn't working. Like, what techniques are you going to use to get back on track? Uh, yeah. To great. Best? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that's like probably links back a little bit to taking those blinkers off. So, firstly, if you've realized your game plan isn't working, that's actually brilliant because you're aware of that. And a lot of people aren't, they go on with a game plan and they just stick to it. And then also linking in, you know, what, what is working. And I think Hearts and I mentioned this on, on the phone when we were chatting the other day about 
Annie Ao is a perfect example of that, of like, if you go on with a game plan and you can execute it very well, you'll win fairly comfortably. If you don't, she's so severe around the other areas of the court that you can actually lose fairly comfortably. And so you have to be aware of what's going on and what's changing it. And um, I think it's from the knock-up. Like we, we spoke about that, didn't we, Carts, about being aware in the knock-up, having yep. a technical, you know, looking at someone technically, um, have they got a weakness? How are they moving in? Have they got a straight arm forehand? Are they got a big twist going on in the backhand? You can generally pick out technical things, but if you've gone on with a game plan to start and it's not working, um, sort of forgive forgive yourself for you know it not working and and try and change it up. And sometimes you can play around with a few rallies of let's go to play in height. For, for two, three rallies and see how that handles. Let's let's go to play in pace for two or three rallies and see how that handles. And quite often something will click. Sometimes it's clicking for yourself, not necessarily for your opponent. So I always knew hitting the ball with a bit more pace sparked up my movement and it linked in really well. So if I was feeling sluggish, it's knowing that sort of thing and testing different areas of the court, you know, just, just having the open-mindedness to test an opponent in a certain area and 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 then but doing it from a point of view of looking for a, you know a gap in in the court that perhaps they're struggling with and then bashing that bit like you know bashing that area like it's a bruise so you know if it's forehand front every time that ball goes forehand front it go it goes in with a straight drop if they boast it straight drop volley straight drop so you you starting to just really look for those gaps in the court and, and not being afraid to mix it up. Okay, so I think um, we are well and truly uh, out of time. Um, Laura, thank you for a totally absorbing and thoughtful um, insight into the competitive game um, and simplifying it for all of us. Um, I know our juniors would have got a lot out of that session. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice, um, nice to talk about it all. Great. Okay, bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's, that's fantastic, that Laura, brilliant. Fab, sorry, that did go, I don't even realise the time. <laughs> that's absolutely brilliant. Okay. Thanks, guys. Some, re some really, really great messages across there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just so, just a heads up for the next group, they're the kind of what we call our silver group. So yeah. they're what our intermediate players, so they're not so advanced in terms of their play. Yeah. Um, so they're joining the county squad and they'll be sort of be playing four or five in a county team sort of thing we're lucky yeah. to be picked so um that's the sort of level we're pitching at okay sounds good well maybe we'll be you know go through the video again and and then maybe be led by their questions a bit generally it'd probably be a bit shorter i'd imagine yeah yeah steve steve like steve's technical. jumping on i spoke to steve this morning and he'll he'll help as well if there's any questions that they're not answering he'll, he'll come forward with some questions as well so. sounds good right. okay right. thanks, thanks laura thanks, thanks, thanks vicky bye, bye. In 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah thanks, so, what, see you bye lovely bye thank you laura should i should i log back on vicky and uh, yeah, yeah use the other call yeah use the yeah. other call reference what Thanks. what time do you want me to log back on um about 15 minutes uh, no sorry yeah, about 15 minutes. I think, yeah, I'm all set okay. up, ready to go. I'll just get a coffee and then come back yeah, up. Yeah, likewise. Okay, okay thanks. In a bit. Bye.